Well, good morning. Good afternoon to some of you and a good evening to some of the listeners in the various corners of the world. Now, my name is Silva Kachikyan, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Armenian International Women's Association virtual program. This is the third of a series in collaboration with the YWCA of Glendale, Pasadena cities in California. We are discussing violence in our communities and in families and how we can create a culture of prevention. Talking about domestic violence or violence of any sort in, is, is actually very relevant today, even more so as we witness firsthand horrific actions of violence in world wars and at home and in our neighborhoods. There is a stigma of shame that is attached to the act of domestic violence, not by the perpetrator, but by the victim and the victims surrounding relatives, friends, or neighbors. And I'm here to tell you that in all honesty, through experience, there is no shame in discussing domestic violence, in recognizing violence in its many forms, and definitely there's no shame in intervention and prevention. On the contrary, there is credit, because intervention and prevention is the responsibility of every citizen and of every institution. Now, AWA has been at the forefront of boldly addressing the issues of violence against women, and for the past many years, has advocated education toward prevention by supporting women's support centers in Armenia to provide necessary tools, counsel and shelter for survivors and their families of children. And as we all know, the YWCA Glendale, Pasadena and uh, Glendale and Pasadena uh, work as a home for sheltering survivors of domestic violence, housing girls, empowerment programs, and advancing racial injustice. Now, our program today will be moderated by Judy Norsegian. Judy Norsegian is a former board member uh, of uh, AWA, and she is actively involved in advocacy for healthy and health and wellness of women, physically, mentally, and emotionally. She is an author and co-founder of Our Bodies Ourselves, and she chairs the board of the same organization. She has appeared on hundreds of television programs and TV programs, uh, television and, sorry, radio programs, and she has served on numerous boards of organizations, one of which is the National Women's Health Network. She has received countless personal recognitions from academic institutions, and holds honorary doctorates from Boston University and Simmons University. But before I pass the platform on to Judy, I want to give you all a quick reminder, of course, that this is being recorded and it will be made available on AWA's website and on our YouTube platform. You will have the opportunity to ask questions and contribute to the discussions toward the end. And we definitely encourage you to do that. So just either raise your hand for attention or use the chat for any comments, questions, and, uh, and any way you wish to participate. And again, a reminder that your names do not appear. And if you do wish to put your name onto the screen, uh, you just hit the enter name on the corner. There are three buttons and in there it'll say rename and you can type in your name if you do so wish to. So Judy, I turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Silva, and thank you for all your many years of incredible contributions to AWA. I'm so grateful that AWA has stayed committed to working on the very challenging problem of gender-based violence, especially domestic violence. About four years ago, when two female members of the Yerevan City Council were physically assaulted in public by fellow councilmen, I remember thinking that this was a sad statement about the current uh, state of our society. And all these women were doing, by the way, was trying to get the city to, to respond to an ongoing problem of leaking sewage from a prison near the Naburashen district in Yerevan. This had become a major public health hazard for people in this community. Like many others at the time, I was shocked to see this public display of violence. And AWA, along with other organizations, issued a statement of protest. 
Ironically, this outrageous behavior occurred just shortly after Armenia passed legislation criminalizing domestic violence. And it was not an isolated incident, as we know. Such violence against women corrodes the fragile democratic institutions within any country and also serves to intimidate women from entering politics and serving as policymakers in various capacities. I believe that institutional violence is often exacerbated by domestic violence, and it is one reason why these AWA sessions aimed at engaging more men in violence prevention so badly needed. We know from much research that the empowerment of women is a necessary precondition for democratic progress, economic growth, and sustainable security arrangements in conflict regions. Patronizing, intimidating, and harming women, whether in the home or in a public space, is a direct assault on Armenia's prospects for a successful future. And our behavior in the diaspora will have a direct impact on Armenia, the country, as well. Fortunately, there are men around the world now changing the public discourse to include ideas about positive masculinity that would promote a safer and stronger world for everyone. A healthy society requires that we respect the human dignity of all of us, including women and girls, and men will be an essential part of making this happen. I am so appreciative of the participation of Armenian men in these three AWA webinars, this being the third, and I look forward to our continuing collaboration. Now, we are unable today to have members of the clergy present in person because of a long-standing interdiocesan commitment that we were earlier unaware of. But Father Vasken, who's the priest at the Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, kindly produced a three-minute video that we will share with you shortly. He and other members of the clergy intend to be part of the follow-up conversations with other men as we explore concrete pro projects that will reduce domestic violence in the Armenian community. Now, what we're gonna do is begin with a trailer for a new documentary. It's not about the Armenian community. It's a film called Some Men that probably won't be complete for another year or so, but it features men who've been active in this sphere of trying to stop gender-based violence. The, the trailer is a, a a suggestion of what this filmmaker, Carol Sinsuti, is going to be producing. And it also features Craig Norberg Bohm, who is going to be facilitating the next part of our session now. And Craig, in fact, will bring up the trailer for you to see, and then he will move on with some comments, and we will get into Father Vaskin's uh, video after that. So I'm passing it over to you, Craig. All right, here you go. Hang on one sec. The single biggest indicator of whether there will be violence internal to a country or that country will be willing to use military violence against another country is not poverty, not uh, access to natural resources, not religion, or even degree of democracy, it's violence against females. You cannot pretend that half the human race is superior to the other half, it's a fiction. So the only way you can maintain it is through violence or the threat of violence. So domestic violence is normal, or normalized. In my neighborhood growing up, there was no phrase domestic violence, it was just called life. Unless it was really, really severe, it was not only normal but blamed on the woman. When it comes to domestic violence, many, many, many people think that domestic violence is a woman's issue, but the majority of domestic violence is perpetrated by men. Looking at the issues around domestic violence and community violence, they all kind of go hand in hand. So the work with men is crucial, because we're talking about male violence that transcends all forms of violence. So it's important that we spend some time and devote some energy into engaging men and fathers and young boys in particular of course, standing together as allies in this work. Sadly, we're still the few men that do this work. So part of what we're trying to do here today is also begin the conversation about why aren't there more men doing this work? It's about teaching, about encouraging positive relationships for young men. One of the most important parts, I think, of uh, 
working with boys and men is um, not just having them hear men say these things, but realize that they have got to respect women's voices and listen, learn to listen to women. Every single man and woman has a role in the primary prevention of sexual and domestic violence, which is the promotion of healthy relationships, the promotion of what is healthy masculinity. When uh, some men started to uh, get interested in uh, the work that feminist women were doing in the 1960s, building rape crisis centers, domestic violence centers, and that sort of thing, and they went to these women and said, how can we help? You can't help us with what we're doing. What you need to do, uh, this is the women talking to the men, what you need to do is talk to the men, talk to boys, tell them to stop hitting women, tell them to stop raping women. Um, in other words, go upstream to the source of the problem. If you go upstream to the source of the problem and, and you can uh, prevent future acts of violence, then we won't have so much work downstream to do. What do you mean by going upstream? What do we mean by primary prevention and prevention in general? Prevention has got lots of different ways of talking about it. You rescue people who are drowning in a river. You go in and grab them. Then you go upstream and get people who are already in the river and get them, get them out sooner. But what's getting people into the river to begin with? And we call that upstream. In our case, what is the source? I want to get more about the domestic violence so that we can bring the education and awareness before it happens That's right. in the community. Because I'm a father. I've got a 34-year-old daughter who's going through a difficult divorce from a domestic violence perpetrator and an abuser. I worked in a program somewhere, to be completely honest. Um, I'm a past domestic violence offender. Oh, welcome. It really was an eye-opener to find out just how frequently this occurs. We must form a barricade with our bodies. But the barricade must move as the ocean moves and be formidable as the ocean is formidable. It became what many people call the first uh, Take Back the Night march in 1978 in San Francisco. And of course, Take Back the Night became institutionalized all over the country and still are. Some of the chronicles of very famous feminist writers who were there and write about it as an auditorium full of women and then women taking to the streets afterwards uh, and marching through San Francisco. Um, but what they don't write about is there were, you know, a very small group of men there as well. And Andrea Dworkin is giving this very fiery speech about how violent men are. And I think she was just throwing down the gauntlet and saying, get serious about doing the work, men. Um, I don't really want to see a bunch of man, men standing around hugging each other and crying about how hard it is to be a man. Get over that and get into the streets or get into the public areas where laws are made and start making changes that will reduce violence against women. If I know that my buddy is a dirk and is clearly perpetrating a, a violence in his family, I should be telling him to knock it off. And I should be getting him and my friends that know him as a chorus saying, come on, let's have a discussion about this. How can we help you? Talk to us. Have a conversation. On the golf course, they should be having this conversation. The golf course would be a great place for this conversation. You know, the locker room, great place for this conversation. So these conversations need to be had by men. Uh, and these conversations, you'll often hear the term locker room talk or the boys or anything like that. And if that's the term that we use and if that's what we have to do to get the message out, then that's what we use. A lot of men take that uh, normal conception of masculinity, domination, of violence, and act it out in ways that are um, abusive to women and violent towards individual women in their lives. That paradigm shift of coming to think of violence against women as an overconformity with this normal conception of masculinity really shifts the way we start to think about how to confront violence against women. It's not just weeding a few bad apples out of the barrel, it's thinking about really redefining what the barrel is and, and everything inside of it. I think when you use the word feminist, I think most guys sort of, they, they quite shy away from, from that term. Uh, and I think that, that people don't understand uh, true feminism. And true feminism, of course, is equal rights for all. That is actually true feminism, isn't it?
There we go. Judy, do you have some words? I just want to say that I'm excited about this documentary. I know of groups of young men on college campuses that I've met with when I've done my talks about women's health. And I've been so excited by the way in which they're thinking creatively about this problem in the locker room on sports teams. It's not easy, but they are uh, trying to do what we call more constructive bystander interventions, you know, how do you get people to stop and think that this is really not a good idea to, to bully, to sexually harass, to do all the things that, you know, we see about us in this society. It is going to be difficult, but this film is going to be an important vehicle for getting these conversations going in many different communities. So when it is done, maybe we can share it in the Armenian community as well. Well, great. Well, thank you. Um, it's a delight to be sharing this information with you all today. This is, a, this is fresh paint, this, this uh, documentary uh, trailer. And we're looking forward to, uh, it's in the fundraising stages now. So we're looking forward to it, to us moving through the stages. Um, I'm sure it has a lot of impact and thoughts are swirling about this material. Please think about your thoughts, make notes, put them into the chat. I'm going to talk a little bit about this material, uh, give some context take about 10 minutes. And then we're gonna go into a conversation with a few of us that are here together, uh, kind of as a panel, and speak about our, our impressions and our passions and hopes about this work. Because our interest is moving forward a conversation over the next period of time that continues and expands, and maybe turns into something a little more practical and substantial in a conversation among men, you might call dialogue, uh, men's dialogue. So let me share a couple of um, slides. Some of you have seen these slides before, because I have uh, I've shown them here in this um, in this. Uh, pardon me, while I um, move to the beginning of my slideshow. Somehow it ended up at the end. Um, this is uh, some of you who've attended the previous two. I've used a similar slides, and uh, the this is. The purpose I bring, which is men are part of the solution, is promoting a healthy and nurturing masculinity for preventing sexual and domestic violence. Um, the Global Men Engage Alliance is something I'm a part of now. I help with the North American, US and Canada uh, chapter. And there are chapters around the world sharing this information and spreading this gospel in a sense about there's a, there is a nurturing masculinity to be promoted. Um, you know, so there's a problem we want to learn to go upstream for solutions. Uh, there are examples on the shelf of programs to put into place. There's a lot of invention that is already, are already going on. I want people to be aware of. And what we are looking for is an invitation for leadership and a space for, for, for leadership <clears throat> along these lines. Um, my history is fairly extensive. I'm in, I'm in semi-retirement. I've been 40 plus years in this work. Early, late 70s, I got involved. A conference got me going. This conference was, was terrific. Did some direct services with men's counseling and then went into prevention practices with the state coalition that gets sexual and domestic violence. And we have a representative here of similar work, the YWCA in um, Pasadena, similar work to that. And then of course now the Men Engage Alliance. I, I share with you that there's a history and a trajectory to this work that, I, that exists. Um, we have to, always appreciate the women who bled the way. Um, as we've just heard in the video, appreciated that very nicely. Survivors, female and male, who, who have come forward and, and used their voices to express what is really going on. The advocates who are in the front lines every day, um, giving this life-saving advice for, for people. And then of course, the men who are here now thinking about this, sharing and struggling to figure out solutions. Um, so I thank all of these folks. Um, some of whom are here with us today. Let me say a few more words about Men Engage Alliance so you're aware of this because it may connect with the diaspora, it, Armenian diaspora, it may connect with Armenian in-country directly eventually. There's a European uh, uh, chapter that is uh, fairly large and growing. And so it was founded some years ago, 2004, and it's an international alliance, largely of NGOs, but individuals as well, to promote gender equality um, in many dimensions, but uh, what we call gender-based violence is one of them, which is sort of what we're centering today. 
Um, so the US and Canada is what I'm directly involved in and uh, what I can give information about, but there are representatives and other folks, other places around the world. Um, the problem is large. You saw in, in the video, a third of women globally um, or more, up to half women and a quarter of men are impacted. I think we're 100% impacted in, in the social dimension, in the, in the values dimension. But with regard to direct violence, it is a large proportion. So very few people are untouched. Um, just to say that it's significant. COVID-19 has only worsened the situation for survivors at home who have fewer, fewer resources, fewer social connections, more isolation. We've talked about the term upstream quite a bit already. It came up in the video, but this is the idea, which is that the medicine uses this, preventive medicine uses this metaphor a lot, which is you're working with the emergency, which is the bottom right area of this chart. This is the river, the wavy lines. You rescue people out of the river who are in trouble. You move upstream by getting, in, getting people out of the river sooner. And then you think of what original prevention or primary prevention is, where, where does it start and how do you prevent people from entering the river at all? And I think all of this work is necessary. In immediate emergency work is necessary, such as the Women's Center in Yerevan and Armenia is doing emergency work with survivors of domestic violence primarily. That's emergency work, it's necessary. Public education moves us upstream, uh, working with schools moves us upstream, working with younger, with children and teenagers about relationships and healthy relationships moves us upstream. And then where's the beginning? I don't think we've quite reached that yet, but we're working on it. And that's what our conversation today moves us further upstream. How are men involved? In many ways. Um, of course, we're focusing on cisgendered heterosexual males, if you know the terms. Um, we are not necessarily talking about the LGBTQ community, although this problem exists there as well in its own way. Um, but the majority community, which we might call master culture, is deeply involved and is our primary focus. Um, some are offenders, up to a third, of course, it's the same as survivors, so it's an equal lateral triangle there. Um, some are victims, um, 10 to 20 percent of the survivors are male. Uh, both sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, and many, many are bystanders. And bystanders is where I'd like to take the conversation now who can contribute and help. We all in this room are in fact, in our own ways, bystanders. We wanna move from bystanders, which is a passive place to upstander, which is an active place. <laughs> but, who, but who's ready is kind of a question we always have to ask. Who's ready to act if you make a call to action? Who's going to act? And I have this simple chart of four categories of the world. Let's see, these are males who might be impacted. Some are really hostile and opposed and are maybe perpetrating, um, would perhaps consider our message interrupting power and authority and not a good idea. Others are uninterested, aren't thinking about it, would rather not think about it. I think it's a large category of males. Then we have a substantial category of males who are willing and ready. Willing and ready, I think, is a, is a term of, hey, I don't like this, and I would love to help if I could. I don't know what to do. Help me figure out what to do. So that would be that category. And we're here today to really, I think, mobilize that community. Active leaders is where the front final community are folks like myself and others in this room who have taken steps, are willing to take steps, willing to be somehow in the lead. And I think different messages are needed for each of these categories, uh, different activities. What would you say to the folks who are hostile and opposed? What would you say to folks who are uninterested and not paying attention? Or what would you say to folks who are willing and ready and so forth? I just present this because when we think about the work, who do we need to talk to? And um, I'm gonna suggest that the willing and ready is an important, most important category in terms of present time prevention. If you're doing emergency work, you're thinking a little differently and we can talk about that. So finally, I'll wrap up a bit and say that we are, there are things we can do just to know that there's concrete examples of projects that are valuable and can be implemented. One is called bystander training or mobilization uh, or, or 
intervention is called, bystander intervention is sometimes called, but there's a program called Mentors in Violence Prevention that trains and is very active, has been very active and has been a lot of experience in different venues doing a simple training for folks to learn how one, what one might do if you see something you don't like, kind of in, in the simplest rubric, see something, say something. I know that the law enforcement uses that term for their bystander education, but this can be used in our situation as well. And everyone can help and it helps emergency services most directly, this kind of training, so it's important. Going further upstream, thinking about nurturing masculinity among dads and fatherhood support. And there's concrete examples, terrific curriculums that can be implemented to do courses for new dads in particular and other and fathers of kids at different age groups um, would be is valuable. Then finally, public affairs and advertising, such as poster campaigns, radio TV, social media, role modeling to celebrate men in nurturing roles is a, is a wonderful model, something you can look up called the Men Care Campaign. I want to tell you about these because these are wonderful examples of things that have been done, can be done, and are, are possible. Without a heavy lift, really. Um, there are things that churches can do. I know we wanted to center that conversation today a bit about uh, the faith communities. And some of the faith communities I'm aware of have done such things as Awareness Month, special services um, and activities. That's usually in the fall, October in the US at least supporting men's group conversations, health group conversations about what is most healthy for males and supporting that among fathers. And then education, public, healthy relations of education for parents, healthy relations of education is a, healthy relationships is a curriculum, even by that name, that is implemented often in high schools, sometimes in middle schools. Um, so there's, there are many things that a, a faith community can do to support, I think, prevention conversations and promoting community health with a, a fine approach. So I, I mentioned these just to help add a thought to today. And I hope people think about them. Um, finally, we're calling for male leadership, help take a stand for change, allow and encourage diversity, talk about roles and become active bystanders and upstanders. And so celebration is key celebrate this change for men, men of, in all roles, in our roles in life, fathers, coaches, friends, colleagues, partners. So this is, this is an important key. The broad strategy, visible public action, welcoming voices, learning happens through doing, and celebration. So this is sort of the, the, the approach I hope we can talk about. We have a panel today, a number of wonderful folks with five voices we have in the room for us to say a few words before we get to your questions and thoughts. Um, we have a short video from Father Boskin, uh, the Holy Trinity Church here, in, as Judy mentioned, Cambridge, Boston, Boston area. Um, Brandon Balayan is here, a journalist. It's wonderful to hear his voice. Uh, Bob Timbekian here, the council, looks in New York. He'll say a few words and we'll sit, introduce him a little more shortly. Ariana Chavez, an advocate, works with the YWCA in um, Glendale, California, and um, an advocate in domestic violence prevention and intervention. And Manu Comprelian, who's an educator, is a task board member of AWA and has wonderful experience in, in moving some of these things along. I'll say more words about folks as we get to each of you. Um, let me uh, uh, move along with this and play the, the welcome video from Father Baskin. How's that sound? Any comment there? I'll take this. Well, I just want to say, Craig, yeah. that Father Vaskin did contract COVID recently, and oh, right. he did right. this despite not feeling that well, as you can imagine. So right. Right. remember that this, as you listen to him, he was still recovering. Right. Okay. Well, I hope this comes across well. Here you go. Hello, everyone. This is a great opportunity to come together as a community, as a greater community of Armenians to talk about an issue that has been long overdue. Many people have asked me over the years if I have a favorite line or verse from our sacraments of our church in the Armenian church. And oftentimes, the one that comes to mind the most is the following. It says in our marriage sacrament that the couple standing before the priest in front of the holy altar 
see are are we're asking God's prayers upon them, blessings upon them to see the children of their children. And that line always stops me and gives me a chill because of the beauty behind it and the meaning behind it. There's a big difference between coming to church for marriage and becoming civilly married. And the difference is faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love defined our um, sacrament of marriage. And from there, everything else goes forward. I think that if we are true to our calling of being Armenian Christians, being that first nation that so proudly tells the world around us that we are the first Christians of the world, that we need to live up to that every day in our homes, in our workplaces, in, in wherever we play. And so I am so grateful that today's conversation begins because domestic violence has the ability to cast a very long, very dark shadow over our people, over our families, into our homes that will hit every home or many lives regardless of age, gender, regardless of where they were born. So today as a community, I look forward to the beginning of a new series of discussions on this topic and many others hopefully down the line that we need to talk about as we are gathered together in this a beautiful country in America, bringing with us the traditions and values of our ancestry. And so wherever this uh, domestic violence is, uh, is, is raises itself, raises its head, uh, may we all as a community come together and address it so that we can provide for our people the truest, beauty, most beautiful jewels of our, of our traditions and realize a family comes together around faith, hope and love, and that we're called to rise to the occasion and create our homes based on those Christian Armenian values. Congratulations on getting together for today. This is the first or the beginning of many great steps forward, I see. And I hope that the Armenian church continues to play a bigger role in the days ahead. I apologize for not being able to be with you today. I have a long-standing commitment with our diocese, and I look forward to working with Judy Nor Norsegan going forward to a face-to-face, um, -face, in-person opportunity for me to share with you other thoughts on subjects like this. And I will hopefully be able to encourage, encourage my clergy brethren, which I don't think will take much encouragement as this is a subject that affects all of us. So as the home is the continuation of the church, let the church also offer its voice in this beautiful um, opportunity to make our homes stronger, better, more Christian based. God bless you all in your efforts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. What happened? Are we okay? <laughs> Did it keep playing? No. <laughs> Sorry for that. Oh, good. Good, good, good. No, I just had to click my buttons here to get back into, into the room. So I'm glad I am. The, um, uh, I'm going to swing this over to our, our panelists, starting with Brandon. Hi, Brandon. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Good to see you in the room. Thanks for joining with us. I so appreciate it. Um, your bio says you're a freelance journalist <laughs> and, uh, and that you've had some uh, terrific work in country in Armenia um, around displaced families from Arksak. Certainly say a few words about that and the comments you'd like Mike to bring may perhaps as questions we ask about what role men can play and what, what's, what's in solutions. Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be in the, the meeting with you all. Um, so um, as far as the role that men can play, um, I'm gonna add some context to my answer. So both my... Please. Both my grandmothers on both sides, maternal and paternal, were uh, domestic violence uh, survivors. And um, I think that seed of what, what role men could play was planted by my father when uh, one day my, my grandfather was, uh, was beating my uh, grandmother and he called the cop, my dad called the cops on my grandpa. Um, he was a teenager at the time, it was the 1980s. Um, I'm sure it was largely unheard of to call, call your, especially in an Armenian household, to call the cops on your dad. 
um, mm -hmm. but he did uh, because he he respected his mother. He loved his mother very much, and he 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 saw the continual abuse that she had to go through. So as a result, he uh, he called the cops. And as a result, after that, after he got out of, um, I think he went to jail for a night or two, and then they he came back. He, he came home and he beat my dad afterwards too. So, um, so knowing what my parents have been through on on both sides, um, and seeing what what role they have played, um, I think that helped me uh, translate that work into uh, into Artsakh. So I think what all men should try to do, Armenian men, is to try to get involved in uh, feminist organizations within Armenia. Uh, Women's Resource Center. I worked. I, I worked with Kuidigs while I was out there in Armenia. Uh, we provided immediate aid to uh, displaced families from Artsakh, um, which there was a big need uh, in terms of pregnant women receiving immediate aid. Uh, Kuidigs has also done work in in Lebanon, providing period pads uh, for those in need. Um, so it's I think them getting involved, Armenian men getting involved within these feminist organizations can create empathy within our culture um, and, and, and help us take the first step to prevent uh, these acts of violence from occurring. I'll give an example from, from our line of work. So we, we've had a case in, um, in a border village in Sunik where we went to their house and every house we go to, they invite us in, they put some coffee on the table and occasionally the men are there. Um, and my boss has told me since I've been there, it's been a little it's been a little easier going to the houses because the men typically leave whenever the, all the women show up. But now since I'm a man and I'm coming into this into these people's houses, the man the man has someone to talk to now. Um, so I think it's a respect thing in in a lot of the border border villages. Um, I don't I don't think men in the border villages see. Uh, if other women come to, to, to meet their, their wife, they're not going to see it as an opportunity. Oh, let me get to know them as well. They just get up and leave. But since I was there, he stayed. And that was the first time they saw that there was some signs of what we thought was domestic violence. Um, he was acting just, he was acting, uh, not, he wasn't hitting his wife or anything, but he was uh, kind of verbally abusing her. And we followed up with her afterwards and thankfully nothing, nothing was going on there. But, um, but among, in terms of the border, the stuff happening in the border villages, uh, it's, it's more, I'm sure it's more common than you think it hasn't happened with us all too often. It was just that one incident, um, thankfully. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in, in this line, in that line of work, you tend to, you have to, especially when you're going to the border villages, you have to be aware of your surroundings and and um, aware of like the social structure whenever you're going into these houses and, and, and be aware and look at the signs whenever you're doing that. Sure, absolutely. I know you were thinking about some of the institutional pieces about some of the rules that needed to be put in for promote safety in that work. Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for, your, for your comments. I'm gonna move on over to, um, to Bob. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you for joining us today. You are, work with the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct and have a strong experience in institutional work. And I know you have some thoughts along those lines. If you want to comment on our, on our, our material so far, feel free. Um, I would. I was actually uh, impressed in listening to Brandon and particularly the story of his father's calling the police on his grandfather. Um, because I think that in any community, certainly ethnic communities, and particularly those in diaspora, such as the Armenian community, um, can, can measure the change in its cultural attitudes um, by looking at the different ways that uh, past and present generations deal with the same issues. Um, my mother, for example, uh, as a child, in the late 1930s, 19, early 1940s, uh, was also a victim of domestic abuse. Uh, and people knew it. Uh, you know, they knew that the bruises were not because she was constantly falling, for example. But nobody said anything about it. Nobody did anything about it. Nobody confronted 
the family to get to the root of the problem because it was considered to be uh, shameful and uh, the kind of thing that you did not discuss or even acknowledge. By the time we get to uh, Brandon's father's generation in the 1980s, there has been somewhat of an evolution where it might have not have been uh, usual for a son to call the police on a father. Um, but it was part of at least a growing appreciation in diaspora, particularly in a country that 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 was in the midst of a of a feminist and equal rights uh, movement, to know that this behavior is not something that should be tolerated, and that there are potential consequences for it. I would suggest that the same situation occurring today might result in greater punishment than a couple of nights in jail. It might result in a of protection. It might result in um, a stay away uh, order of the court. It might result in um, custodial issues involving which parents have um, access to the children and under what circumstances. We, 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 we evolve over, over time and over generations, hopefully um, always moving forward, if uh, incrementally. And I think it's an important you know, feature of this conversation to realize that for as much work as we have to do, uh, attitudes are changing. There is uh, a greater willingness to confront and verbalize these problems. And I was encouraged listening to the remarks uh, by Father Vaskin to recognize that um, a priest is willing to participate and lead in a conversation about a topic that would otherwise have been uh, taboo for the Armenian community and, and particularly for the clerical community. Our culture, like like, like many strongly identifiable ethnic cultures is full of contradictions. In many ways, Armenia culturally is, is matriarchal. Uh, we all know that the fulcrum of our families from my generation, from my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation were the, were, were the women, mothers and the grandmothers around whom um, everything evolved domestically. At the same time, uh, and not for nothing is 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 the statue in the highest point of Yerevan, uh, a woman with a sword. But our institutions tend to be patriarchal. And while that might not necessarily seem like a contradiction on the surface, I, I think we will all recognize the, the model um, of the matriarch in the Armenian culture who uh, adores, reveres, excuses the sons for behavior that they would not tolerate in their daughters, which sends something of a mixed signal as you're growing up, uh, because you are, you are basically raised and appreciate that it's your mother and your grandmother who keep the family together, uh, but that they're also willing in many ways to overlook uh, some of you, some of you, more uh, objectionable behavior while they hold your sisters accountable for uh, the same. And, and in this regard, it seems to me that, uh, as encouraged as I am by by Father Vaskin's remark, and it doesn't escape me completely that, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was born and raised in the United States. Uh, he has a, although he has a a, a strong Armenian cultural um, identity. He he grew up in in a in a more liberal society than what might be the case in in, in Armenia. Um, but I would say that in some respects, the church as a patriarchal institution um, has some introspection uh, to do as well. Uh, there are things the church can do. I think to move this 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 awareness and this process along. It can certainly host 
uh, seminars, discussions at the parish level, at the diocesan level. Perhaps uh, they can, in order to encourage people to come forward, uh, identify uh, members of the community with social work and counseling backgrounds to be available kind of as, as, as ombuds people for those in the community who want to engage in conversation, who want to confront the issue, who want to challenge what they see as abuse, to have a safe place that they can go to talk to somebody about it, whether they're the victim or somebody who wants to stand up for a victim, or, you know, as, as we get even more nuanced about this, who see help for themselves because they perhaps recognize that they have a problem and they want to be able to confront it, but not necessarily in a big um, public way. One of the things that, that impressed me about the first two seminars in this series was that you had folks in each who talked about the simple everyday things that any of us can do, which is set an example in your personal life. And if, and if you'll indulge me to tell a, a short tale of two cities, Yerevan in 1994 and New York in 1996. In 1994, um, I was in Yerevan, I was teaching at the American University of Armenia and giving lectures at Yerevan State on political science, constitutional law, and so forth. Um, it was at the height of the embargo. And there was, generally speaking, throughout the day, no electricity in the country. But various sections of town, uh, at most, for two hours a day, would have power. You never knew which two hours a day it was going to be, however. And one morning at two o'clock, the lights go on. The radio that you left turned on so that you'd wake up knowing that you had power came on. And my family and I were living in an apartment on Bagramian Street. And there was a cafe right across from our balcony. And within minutes of the power going on, there's noise, there's activity. And I go out onto the balcony. And down below, a crowd of men. They're drinking, they're playing backgammon, they're socializing. Where were the women? Well, in talking to some of the men that I saw, I found out where the women were. It might be two o'clock in the morning, but they had power. So they were doing laundry. Uh, they were doing things by, by electric light that they couldn't do. Uh, during the day because, because there was no energy. Uh, in 1994, it was relatively soon after the, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union, it was relatively new in Armenian independence. For all of the uh, women that I knew associated with the universities and, and, and otherwise, there was only one that I was aware of who owned and drove a car in Yerevan. Now, that situation obviously is a lot different than today than it was at the time. Flash forward two years. My family is hosting two high school sophomores from, from Armenia for their sophomore year in school in New York. They were dumbstruck by, the, by, by observing the man of the house doing laundry, doing dishes, taking the, my daughter to a preschool, showing up interchangeably with my wife for uh, parent of the day in, in preschool. They were astounded that my wife had a separate bank account in her own name. Uh, and they observed that she was a full-time working mother. She was a journalist uh, working for a New York City newspaper. And they were culturally, I think, uh, surprised that within an Armenian family, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and I should point out here that, that my wife is, is Irish American, um, so that they also learned that it's okay for an Armenian man to marry someone who's not Armenian and can still be active and participant uh, in, in Armenian community life and activities. Uh, and I think they learned a lot from it. And going to school, 
uh, with American raised non-Armenian kids uh, and seeing girls excelling athletically, mathematically, competing uh, with boys in a way that was not necessarily the norm back then in, in Armenia was eye-opening to them. And I think it, it contributed to, to, their, to their becoming um, better rounded individuals so that both of them uh, came back to go to college in the US. They became our, our adoptive nephews, so to speak. Um, uh, one of them has a, a, a finance company that's based in Armenia. And he not only, I think is comfortable with the notion of, of parity between men and women, uh, but he's broken a cycle of Armenian male attitudes toward women by encouraging and helping to finance uh, his wife's own uh, business wow, in setting up preschools, which, which is ex ex absolutely extraordinary. It sounds like so, it really is. I mean, the social change necessary can be run by example. And you're finding that in your own family, there's examples of these changes. Well, I think, I think so. And, I, and I, 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 I wish the world had been a little more evolved at the time my mother was, was sure, suffering as a, as a kid. Um, but recognizing that these things uh, tend to progress on, uh, on a continuum and we can each do something in our day-to-day -day life uh, without necessarily making a monumental uh, cataclysmic change, but incrementally changing attitudes and uh, that will pass down from generation to generation so that we, we continue the progressive evolution um, of, of our culture. That's right. Well, thank you, Bob. It's really true. Let me turn it back over to Brandon. If you have some thoughts about culture or cultural solutions or strengths in the Armenian community that come to mind. We'll hear from you, then we'll switch over to the next person. Yeah, so um, in terms of in Armenia, um, uh, like, uh, like Robert was saying, the, we do in some ways have a matriarchal society. So we respect women a lot, um, but at the same time there's patriarchal institutions. So um, I can kind of offset everything. Uh, yeah. In terms of in Armenia, uh, one strength that I saw is that within some institutions like the birthright organization, they made it very apparent to uh, the woman of the program that, uh, so at first I was participating in Gyumri and during our orientation that uh, the birthright director, Sevan, he made it very clear that in Gyumri for the woman, uh, men tend to follow you at night. So it's advised to walk with a man. And when you're walking with another birth rider, another female birth rider, yeah. uh, and a man happens to follow them, you're not just saying to the, uh, to the guy who's following them, hey, stop it, this is wrong. They're seeing that another guy is telling them to stop and telling them it's not okay and telling them it's not right. Another Armenian man telling them that it's not right. Um, so, like Robert was saying before, it's like incremental changes that I see. It's, I definitely see it as a strength within this generation that yeah. we're not tolerating stuff like that in this generation. Like it's, um, and it was apparent in during last summer in our, in our um, with my birthright group that there were multiple instances of other birthrighters getting followed. There was one instance of this birthrighter in Yerevan. She was calling a cab and this, the, this man was standing right next to her. And whenever the cab would come, he'd pay the cab so they'd, so they'd go off. Um, so, he, so she could come with him. Um, thankfully, one of my friends was there. He's, he, and this, this other birth artist did not speak good Armenian. So this man was completely taking advantage of her. But thankfully, one of my friends was there. And he stopped the situation from um, unfolding. And uh, he prevented something bad from, really bad from happening. So... In terms of strengths of, of this generation of, of Armenians, I think uh, Armenian men in particular um, are not going to are, are, aren't tolerating nonsense like that. But that goes to say, uh, a new poll came out in um, in, in CivilNet, um, not in regards to domestic violence or um, or anything like that, but 
it, about like 56% of men and like 43% of women don't want more women to be in parliament, which is, mm-hmm. which is an issue. And also uh, sexual assault like in public is not a law, isn't, isn't a law in Armenia and in the South Caucasus in general. So men can get away with this stuff and there's not women in parliament to pass a bill to get enough votes in order for this bill to pass. Um, so I see strengths and I also see those weaknesses sure. in the Armenian community. Sure. And you see some change coming along, but it's not nearly there. No, no. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing you uh, respond to questions later. So thank you. I'm going to pass the baton over to Ariana Chavez with the uh, YWCA Glendale, Pasadena. Thank you for joining us. You're a program manager and an advocate. Mm-hmm. So welcome very much. I know you have some comments for us about yes. all of this. Um, so as Greg mentioned, um, why we're, I'm from YWC Glendale and Pasadena. We have a comprehensive domestic violence program. Additionally, we have comprehensive connections within many organizations, but also with, with churches around our community. Um, we, we have, we have um, pastors, folks who come into our, our centers, um, our, our, mainly our community engagement, um, things that we have specifically in October when it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, We do have, um, in October, we have an event called Purple Tie Awards where we celebrate men in the community on the work that they do. And every time we've done it two, three times, I believe, Mm -hmm. Um, every time we have a, a, member from a church, from a religious organization highlighted. Um, additionally, we have groups, and Sylvia is, is aware of this, uh, from that give, give donations to us and do, do revenations in our shelter or in our community center to help out um, the women that, that are in there. And additionally, we have um, we also have, I have always a uh, Glendale um, United Methodist Church who every year during Mother's Day um, reach out to me to do um, donations for our mothers in our shelter. So we have the community presence and um, it's getting that word out. Um, and we're very, very thankful for, for our, our church community who is out there and letting their their community members know the resources that are out there and sometimes going to YWC Glendale and Pasadena our our Lexington location and bring a survivor or a victim into the building to help out Mm -hmm. um and one of the comments that or things that I've been thinking about um from the previous panelist is um as a first generation um, Latina who was born here. We have a lot of similarities Mm -hmm. um, where, where, um, where, yes, the woman is like the, the glue of the, of the household, but outside she is not. Um, So, and we're, we're also working on bringing equality um, because we see the the differences you know and I know myself I've my my dad he without my mom I don't know how he would survive like to clean cook all of that where it's kind of like what are you going to do if something happens to her you know like me as the only woman or the only daughter he has I'm like I'm not going to do everything that my mom does for you. So it's changing that mindset within our community, within our homes to be, to be like, okay, let's do this equally. Let's clean together. Let's cook together. Or you do this, you do that. And it's a lot of work. And I, and I feel too, that, that our generation, we're changing that. We're changing that mindset saying, no, let's do this. Let's do that. Because we never know what might happen. Um, but yeah, that's my two right. 
Great. Well, that's wonderful. Thanks, Ariane. It sounds similar in terms of this generation that you're part of, along with Brandon, mm -hmm. are thinking about this. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about this, and which is really good. I'm going to move on. Yes. I just want to say that we so appreciate that you, Ariana, and others at the Glendale YWCA have been helping us think about this project and follow up. For people who are coming for the first time, we have another staffer there, Hasmik Borushian, who's participated in the planning and spoke at the last session, who has also found some of the younger Armenian men, like Brandon, to participate <laughs> in these discussions. And it's these conversations and this networking that is gonna build the foundation of something that will be an ongoing presence. And we'll, we hopefully will get traction because as you've heard from both Bob and Brandon, we have glimmers of light. We have examples of men who are comfortable um, speaking out, you know, providing that much needed intervention, but they're not gonna be popular with most men in their community, not yet. They won't be seen as um, in a positive light the way all the women around will. And we need to change that. Um, I, I know we have one more um, panelist who's gonna respond, but we also have uh, a participant who may have to leave soon. And she has some really interesting things to share with us in terms of her own work in this very space. And I'm hoping Vika, you could come on and share some of the work you've been doing in Armenia and around the whole idea of involving lyricists and music in engaging men in a way that will change attitudes. Um, so if you unmute yourself, Vika, we have a little time for you now and then we'll resume. Hi, everyone. Hi thank there. you, Judith, and you, thank you, Craig. And um, yeah, I would love to share the project um, and what came out of that project. I was absolutely stunned with the observation one of the um, men <laughs> shared with me. Okay, just give you an idea what is the pro what the project is about. Uh, as a strategist, I was looking uh, to find out the elegant solution in empowering women. And elegant solution, that's a mathematical term to with the least effort, time and funds to get the biggest possible outcome. So when I analyzed different from different angles, I came up with the idea that um, lyric, a music, a lyricist are potentially are very, very powerful people if they know how to influence through their lyrics. Because as a also as a a hypnotist with 20 years of experience. I know how words can go into unconscious and change people's values and therefore their behavior. And I observed that in 1992, to, uh, starting when Tata's songs change men's behavior in Armenia, when they uh, publicly never would admit that they love their kids, but after his two songs, how he loves uh, his son and his daughter in 10 years, which is a, a anthropologically, anthropologically very short period, men behavior changed. Uh, I was observant, I could see perhaps that wasn't the only contributor, but it was very obvious. So the project was to uh, educate uh, Armenian lyricists, songwriters first, uh, sensitize them, gender sensitize them, and then teach them persuasion engineering as executive coach. I know persuasive engineering, inspiration engineering, and we did that in March, 2021. Uh, I raised funds with United Nations Population Fund, and we did the project. We educated 17 Armenian lyricists, songwriters, uh, sensitized, helped them to understand uh, what women going through and what's happening in Armenia, and then how to use the lyrics to influence. So I can happily share with you that we have 20 songs that will help to uh, help the, that will help men and women learn uh, how to, what, what are different values. Okay, just go back to um, shorter time uh, for me. 
uh, I'm sorry, to take less of your time. Um, those songs will empower women and also empower men. Now let's go back to my observations. Uh, what I observed, and I met many researchers there, and of course I go through USAID, through UN research. Uh, there are a lot of research mentioning that boys in Armenian schools are raised in a way that instead of helping them to uh, flourish, grow, they, uh, for any little thing they do, they get better scores than girls, and that doesn't allow them to grow and to develop, which is like degrade them, sorry for that word. And that there are some observation that uh, um, young men, instead of thinking what kind of, like in, on television, many, many mentioned with PR company I was working, they brought me statistics that now the, uh, their goals are changed instead of looking that they are going to be supportive in their family, at least at the old way. No, now they are looking for a, a rich girl to get married and that she has to work, she has to bring kids, she has to. So that's a total shift. And, and then my main uh, observation, actually it came, uh, not observation, but I heard from one of the lyricists. And he said that he's free because he can cook, he can do his laundry, he can do anything. He doesn't need woman to do that for him, like serve him. And he is free and he can choose to be with a woman for her quality, not to serve her. And for me, that was the first time when I realized that, okay, who is, where is the core? Core is with women who has raising their sons in a, in a way that they can be, uh, can contribute to this prevent, like woman, uh, equal, woman men equality. Actually what we do as women, we, we do the opposite. Uh, and then I realized that I did that, up, uh, I did the difference uh, because I didn't allow my two sons when I was in Armenia up to 19, up to 2000. I didn't allow my sons to communicate with my extended family. I kept them away. I didn't want them to learn those um, behavior and to pick up those values. I, I, just want to interrupt. I just wanted to share, that's it today. There's, well, there's more that you need to share and I know that and we're gonna make it possible. I'm gonna work with you offline after this so that you, both what you're doing and your story will come to light because you have a wealth of experience and knowledge that we wanna bring into the circle. But because we have so little time left, I wanna move over so that Manu can share a couple of minutes of his thoughts and then we'll have at least 10 minutes or so for um, community participation. This is not the end of this conversation, but we wanna honor people's schedules and be done by 3.30 Eastern time today. But thank you for sharing what you just did. <coughs> Craig, you want to? Uh, before going a little long, I just got it. <laughs> of course. Manu, I know you have thoughts to share about the conversation today and your hopes and dreams. You're on mute still, as they say in Zoom land. <laughs> you, you all remind me of sitting in a village. And Vika, I hope you're still here, um, where it was so beautiful that. All I can remember is counting seven gentle breezes, zephyrs, uh, zephyrs. And uh, I'll, because you have to leave Vika, you remind me in your story of Barbara Benjoyan, the great playwright. And uh, she said exactly what you said because she brought her two sons, Casper and I forgot the other ones, to Armenia and she saw what you saw. And she wanted to straighten that out. Um, so thank you so much. And to the um, <clears throat> and to Dead Voskin, uh, I'm gonna put in the loop because he brought it up twice: faith, hope, and love. That's what we do in baptism. 
to show what's possible in the church. There's an NPR piece. I'm going to hit return now. You can Google that. It's simply right, Manuk Baba. And it's talking about eight Congolese refugee children baptized in the Armenian church. And they attend church all the time. Um, Brandon, what can I say? You, you are absolutely uh, wonderful today. And, uh, and, and, and while you were talking, I, I had the memories of, uh, of having to ho house a young child like you who witnessed uh, a more severe uh, domestic violence. When the DCYF, Department of Children's Families, the courts and the, uh, the Rhode Island State Family Court and the International Institute had to choose some place to uh, house four children who found their mother dead. And it, it turned out to me, thank God I was in the church community at an event at the time when that December 12th call, uh, call came. And I was going to hold in front of you what my cleaning staff found was a picture that the youngest of the four children drew in a story he wrote that was under the furniture because that pain comes out through the way you color, the way you draw, and so on. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, this is, uh, I'll hold this up. If you can't read Russian or Georgian, it's, a, it's a, an expression I hanged in my office in 1995 when I was sent by the State Department to recover women. And it simply says, every child deserves a healthy mother. Now, Robert, you're, you're wonderful. Powers of observation uh, 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 are just so lovely. And you know, the, the, when you mentioned double standard, it was wonderful. When, you, when I lived in Armenia and I was there in 94 uh, under the uh, expressed uh, wishes of the first lady because there was an international conference of women that I had to address at that time. And then I mean international, not international Armenian. We're talking Ireland and Germany and in other countries, England. But you know, when I, I observed the men and just the way, and when you talk about lifting the loads, doing the work, walking a straight line, it is just um, exactly what I saw. And if there's a moment at the end that Silva knows and Judy knows that I have three minutes of a poem of, of looking, to look so that women can teach us if we open our eyes. Brent, Robert, you opened your eyes. The double standard of many is when you see men walking and they're meandering. You know, this is in like you're talking to guys at the cafe. And that kind of walking if women do that, she would be so criticized. That's the double standard in that. I'm sorry, somebody's trying to ring my bell. I'm at Ani Suites. My, and I, I got a little note to address the going forward. And the church um, that we have, first of all, I'm very conservative. And I got to tell you that this is a very difficult moment for me because I we lost somebody in our family moments before this conference who was killed in a car accident. And I also um, was on a phone call with uh, Mission Armenia and Yerevan Zoom call with Jane Mahakin to help with the, uh, the elderly. But um, I'm, I, I come from a very conservative point of view. And I know I saw Judy's note about uh, uh, about economics and women. And, and I'm so proud of the Judy's in this world and the Catherine and Gustians that were the top women in this country for women's reproductive rights. And Amine Babayan, who's written up on the same subject that Judy brought up on economics and men, is an Armenian woman originally from Baskistan, and it's printed into the United Nations magazine. This is what our women have done in this country. And in the church, the women, not only Armenian women, but women in general, there was no deniers of Christ. We men, we forget that. We, we forget as Armenians that the first sainted Armenian was a woman and so on and so forth. So I'm very traditional. 
And, and the doctrine, and I, I hope to bring it because I've had guests here and I will be speaking uh, at the seminary and somebody has a question. Uh, Manuk, I just want to interrupt for one minute because we only have about um, eight minutes left and I want to be sure that some of our participants can unmute and share their thoughts or ask their questions, which we may not get to completely today, but we will follow up. And in particular, I'm hoping that some of the participants might give some thought to how they see the clergy becoming more involved. We definitely have a commitment from Father Vasken. I think Father Arakelian in New Jersey has also made a commitment. Um, Father um, Haider Simeon, from, who is with the Diocese uh, in New York uh, City, also has made a commitment to be involved in the follow-up conversations. But what do you envision um, as a concrete step forward. For example, getting to the men's clubs associated with the churches so that we have guest speakers, some of our panelists um, presenting these ideas, uh, joining in with AYF and maybe getting onto the sports fields, just as other um, coaches have done with this issue with sports teams um, in non-Armenian communities. What are some of your thoughts about the church and maybe even in other institutions stepping up to the plate on this issue. So you simply can unmute yourself and speak. We are such a small group now. Um, and also many of you have enter name. I don't even know who you are. So um, that would be one way for us to see you if you uh, came on screen. Anahit? So, yes, hi. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for this program, by the way. I, I, I'm. Uh, I've uh, tuned into two out of the three and, and um, you know, really, really appreciate your doing this. Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, Judy. I think having the men's clubs, I think it's very important to have a facilitator, either a, psych a psychologist or um, somebody else who's, you know, in, in the video that you showed, Craig, um, I, I, I saw um, Quentin uh, yeah. speak at, a, at a, a program at the New York City Bar Association. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, having somebody like him talk to the, uh, you know, first of all, train the clergy, but also have a facilitator with men's clubs at, at various churches, I think it's very important. I think there needs to be a safe space for Armenian men to discuss domestic violence, whether they themselves have been abusers or they have seen abuse in, in their homes, uh, you know, just, I think that's the first step, you know, and obviously a, a, another thing that we've talked about is I'm co-chair of the Domestic Violence Committee of the Armenian Bar Association. And, wow. we, you know, we're talking about ways to, in, you know, engage men. And I think another thing is, um, you know, to think sort of more holistically and, and uh, maybe work with Armenian schools, you know, to to have, you know, maybe age appropriate programs where we um, have, uh, you know, teach kids how to have healthy relationships with each other, because, you know, that's where it really starts, right? I mean, they're, they're seeing these unhealthy relationships in the home and, um, you know, violence encouraged in the classroom, you know, boys hitting girls and the teacher not saying anything, um, at least one, something I heard about in Armenia. So, you know, I think those are some ideas, but in terms of the church specifically, yeah, men's clubs for sure. And even ch youth groups, there are youth groups in churches, you know, have somebody come and talk to the kids about, um, you know, healthy relationships. I mean, at my parish, St. Sarkis Church, there's a salt and light group. And I think that group is in many different, uh, you know, churches. Those are all teenagers. Perfect time to talk about this, you know, when as they're starting to date. Um, so some ideas there. Absolutely. Thank you. Very astute. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Anahi. Anybody else want to unmute and share a thought or idea? Any of the panelists? Bob, Brandon. <laughs> Deborah. Well, <clears throat> you know, um, this is a, a very uh, touching, you know, conversation among so many people here. And I really appreciate hearing everyone. It's just they, everybody added so much to this conversation. And um, 
I'm, I'm thinking myself as we, everyone was speaking about how, how odd it is that we, um, we can't seem to grasp what the personalities of these men are. There's such a variation. You know, there's the young man who wants to be in a gang so that he's under, you know, that he's under, um, so he's part of and, and he is actually a, probably a good kid and he's just doing this to develop. So there's so many, so many parts of how men become, you know, uh, uh, um, having a way. Now, you know, the, the, a way of responding to women. Um, and, you know, um, I was very impressed with the church saying that could they, you know, think about the future generations and, and understand that that's what you're leaving them if you don't change your behavior, if we don't change the behavior. Um, but I guess my, my, my thought is about the word abuse and domestic violence. They're words that are used a lot, of course, and, but um, I'm wondering if this allows men to understand rather than deny that hurtful behavior, simple, simple phrases like hurtful behavior, teach them that you don't want to hurt somebody else. I mean, we would naturally say that in terms of how to treat a dog or, you know, it, 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 somehow more phrases that might help men at all of these variations of their experience to create um, this behavior. Um, if there's a way in which we can have different levels of explanation that all say the same thing, but could bring them in a little bit more. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I haven't developed it. It just made me think of the nouns we use rather than the verbs and not the violent verbs, but the verbs that have a, has a, have a, a thoughts about how to approach these, this, this narrative, how do we, how do we talk about it in, in a very different way at times? That's you know. terrific, Debbie. And I'm, I know that you've agreed to help <laughs> advise us as we go forward because <laughs> you have such a wealth of experience as a social worker and someone who's an Armenian feminist. Uh, uh, the, this is something that's a work in progress, clearly. We are down to our last few minutes, unfortunately. So we're uh -huh. gonna have to wrap up. Um, uh is may i uh deborah uh what to answer your question and to go right to craig right from the beginning all of what we're doing is to get the men and the church to the point where they ask us what can we do what can we do what can i do you know to show them that there is this alternative and i will do it any means possible, even if it's humor. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that Anahit just suggested, which is that we establish some trainings for priests, members of the clergy, so that they know better how to handle these situations. Within the last year, I've heard of three or four instances where a priest told a woman to go back to an abusive situation in her family. That's not the way to counsel women. And so if they had training, they would know how better to handle such situations. Um, I also know of several examples where <clears throat> the priests actually encouraged the woman to get help from a domestic violence organization in the community. So we're moving the needle there as well. It's just that we need to do more. Uh, well, we that's now a, have one or exactly two minutes right. left. Bob? I was just going to say that your last observation, I think, is exactly right. And it's, it's what I was alluding to earlier uh, in suggesting that the church, too, needs some introspection because we don't necessarily want the conversation to be led uh, by an institution that has had um, not quite such an enlightened uh, attitude or approach about women in the first place. Um, I think some of you know that, that my sister is an Episcopal priest because really the only place in the Armenian church for her as a woman was in the choir. And it didn't really allow 
for the natural expression of her um, herself. Uh, and it would be helpful. And I think that's why, you know, a younger generational cadre of priests like Father Vaskin can lead can lead this conversation in the church because because they do have or what appears to be a broader um, uh, scope and a greater breadth than the than the traditional old fashioned earlier generation Armenian priest to be able to, to actually with credibility have this conversation. And Bob is right. And we have elevated women to the form of deacons. That's why I was trying to say I'm a very conservative mm -hmm. Armenian. The it's orders 18, came down 30. from his whole holiness that I want the women returned to the positions in the church that they were. And, the, and as Judy had mentioned before, there was way there was uh, some host environments that priests grew up in that and that do not make them perfectly Armenian priests. They have to understand if you grew up in the Middle East, you might be hesitant to do what your high holiness is telling you to do. Well, okay, I think I'm gonna pass it back to you, Silva, because we have to wrap up. It is now 3.30. We know we could go on forever and this conversation will continue. Um, but thank you everyone for being here today and for giving us a few more ideas we will be doing more outreach. There will be a follow-up roundtable conversation where we get into more concrete possibilities for being in communities, in person, on Zoom, however it can work out. Yes, uh, and thank you very much for such, um, uh, and it, it's, I hate to say it, the subject, it, but it was inspiring because it is motivating us to actually do more than we are doing right now. It is. Uh, it really is up to us to approach our institutions, uh, especially after hearing Reverend Father Vasken in this particular session. We need to approach our churches even more, as Ariana mentioned, that uh, the churches do work closely with the within the communities. Uh, I know for a fact, for example, she was talking about that they acknowledge a priest or somebody in the uh, in the institution as a uh, person who has helped with these issues and I know that uh, father there was a father Vasquez Mopsisian who earned it twice uh, over through the uh, Y and I um, uh, I do encourage that but I think more than that more than the churches being involved it is up to us really to approach the clergy approach our places of worship and actually ask them how they can be involved and engage their men. What, I mean, each of us, it, it is our responsibility because this matters to us and it is our human right. I do believe in that. So we hope you'll follow through on the campaign to end the violence against women. It calls on the cross section of society as we've heard, starting in the home, in classrooms, in playgrounds, in our places of worship, our churches, our businesses, our organizations, and everywhere within our personal relationships. It means working toward long-term comprehensive, of course, strategies, but they'll tackle the root cause of violence. We will protect the rights of women and girls and men with equality for all genders. It is our human right. I keep repeating that because you just can't escape it. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank Judy, Craig, Manu for initiating this campaign. I want to thank the YWCA Glendale and Pasadena for partnering with AWA on this universal issue. And thank you, Ariana, again, for devoting your time uh, once again. And to our guests, Robert uh, Tembekjan and Brandon Balayan, thank you, honestly, for sharing your knowledge and speaking through your voice of experience and for being active participants today. I'm sure you will be tapped for further discussion among the group and, uh, and also to help form the strategy to uh, engage more men. And to, Father, um, to Reverend Father um, Vasken Kuzuyan, who participated through video, we will need more courageous men in the clergy, as clergy and as lay people who are willing to advocate and help change the culture of violence. Thank you all who participated. This is really a good start. 
before I, I know we're going on ahead of time, but I also want to let you know, since Anahid was here as well, that on March, on May 22nd, the ABA uh, will be having, uh, will be partnering with AWA to have a session on the, there is no more shame in, in discussing this and in putting this out into the open. And participants will also be from the Women's Support Center in Armenia, and they will also be participants from the, I believe, the Minister of Culture and uh, Foreign Affairs from Armenia, as well as lawyer from here and from there to see how legislations are, how we changing the legislation to uh, a legislature to, um, to actually um, bring some change and how we can enforce, it's not a good word, but enforce those changes. <laughs> so, and thank you to all these attend, to all the attendees. Honestly, uh, we appreciate your uh, participation and uh, especially when you join us at these different time zones on a Saturday. Now, please look out for our future events. And if you're not yet a member of AWA, we encourage you to go to our website. We also do accept men, you know. I not mean to throw that in that Manuk was also the first and only man on our board of directors, uh, serving on our board of directors. So thank you for that too. So we do encourage men and women to join the global network of the women who share our values. And our uh, goal is always to engage our communities, enable connections, enhance well-being, elevate leaders, and empower women globally. So please stay well, stay safe, stay relevant, and see you next time on one of our events. Thank you again, all of you, for the participation. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all of you. Bye-bye.